Um, okay, well, welcome everybody in the room and online. And online, please let us know if you can't hear it. <laughs> Perhaps that's useful to check by chat. Um, but so this is the Synapse seminar series, which is run in the School of Culture, History and Language, and also the Evolution of Cultural Diversity Initiative. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri First Nations on whose unceded lands we're meeting here in Canberra today. Um, our aim of the Synapse series is to encourage conversations on the human past that cut across uh, multiple disciplinary perspectives. And so it's really great to start off this year's um, series with Joao Teixeira. <laughs> Um, Joao is a research fellow here in CHL, and his research brings together population genetics, ancient DNA, archaeology, and anthropology um, in exploring the origin and evolution of human species. Um, so some of his current research is exploring encounters between archaic and modern human populations in island Southeast Asia, New Guinea, and Australia. Um, as well as he also has projects on the genetic impacts of historical migrations in Europe. And his talk today is going to cut across both of these different time bits in understanding the human past. So thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Beth. And uh, yeah, appreciate the, <laughs> you got my name right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Having asked you earlier. <laughs> yeah, no, that's still the uh, commendations for the effort. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as Beth was saying, so my research really, you know, uh, I'm a population genetic, you know, geneticist uh, by background, and uh, the idea is that, you know, I can bring genetics as a tool to understand the human past, and, uh, you know, I realized at some point that, you know, you can only do that if you talk to people that, you know, address the same question, but from different perspectives, and that's why, you know, I guess I do not use archaeology like myself, but I do try to get as much archaeological and anthropological insight as possible into my research, not only just, you know, in the interpretation of the results, but actually on the design of the projects that I work on, which I think is uh, important. And so today's talk is going to be about that. So, you know, uh, I'll try to give you an overview of how I'm using genetics as a tool to understand hum the human past and human history, both on like the remote past, uh, in particular, like Pleistocene, you know, interactions between modern and so-called archaic humans, but also like in a more recent past, and, you know, historical uh, migrations and historical processes, including like the incidence of particular genetic syndromes, for example. And so, yeah, I don't have to tell you uh, about like how ancient DNA is, you know, recently became, um, recently became widespread um, in, in the history of, of uh, the human past and genetics, what, you know, has been has grown in importance over the you know later part of the uh, 20th century, but really in the 21st century with the development of ancient DNA techniques, um, you know this became more and more apparent. So we can now directly use genetic information from individuals that lived in particular periods of time to not only infer but directly measure what was the genetic diversity and the frequency of different genetic variants in particular time and in particular uh, places. And so today I'll be talking about these two projects that are completely different, uh, both in scope, but also in time and in geography. And they're both been they've both both been published, so you know you're not going to learn anything new. I'm sorry for that, <laughs> uh, but you do. I, I'm just putting it here so in case you want to uh, dig, you know, through after this talk and discuss. We can we can do this a bit more in detail, including like some of the methodology, which I'm not going going to go into too much detail today. But before we go into that, I sort of, I thought, because most of these um, talks are meant to be interdisciplinary, and because the audience, I was uh, informed, is not constituted necessarily by geneticists, the first thing I wanted to go through very briefly uh, is how do we, as geneticists, or population geneticists, think about the evolutionary process? And, and then, because I think it's important that you understand where we're coming from, so you understand the perspectives we're trying to um, Analyze, and this is going to be really like a two-minute crash course <laughs> on PopGen. So, you know, population genetics, you know, works by and tries to understand evolution by looking at the interplay of five different forces. It's like in physics, right? But you hear the forces, you know, they impact the emergence, the frequency, and the ultimate fate of genetic variants through time. So 
you've probably heard of either all of these or at least most of these uh, forces. Uh, and so what we do is that we try to reconstruct the past using, you know, predictions based on this formal, uh, you know, um, the formal uh, uh, implementation of these of these different forces. So mutation, of course, is the ultimate generator of diversity. So if we're all different from each other, we're all the same in many regards, we're also all different. Uh, and so that is possible through a process known as mutation. So fortunately, uh, replication of the DNA chain is not perfect through time. It goes, it undergoes mistakes, and those mistakes is what make possible, uh, you know, that all the diversity of life that we see on the planet to exist. Then that diversity gets shuffled in each generation in the case of uh, sexual reproducing individuals, which are, you know, humans are an example. And so that process of shuffling of genetic varieties within a person and within the population is known as recombination. And we'll go a bit more into detail on those two so you can visualize um, how this actually then works. And then the different variants that emerge through time in different places and different times, they undergo this process of random, you know, um, inheritance. So they might be, they might be passed on or not in particular generations, depending on the frequency of the variant the size of the population. And so that random stochastic process of passing on uh, genetic variants through time is known as genetic drift. That's also what leads, you know, ultimately most variants to either get fixed. So if you have a population that has variant A and variant B appears, the, you know, whether variant B makes it or not is a function most likely of genetic drift. So how big is the population and how likely it is that that mutation is just drafted to the next generation? The natural selection, I guess this is the, the one I don't need to introduce, right? When you have particular variants that potentially confer adaptive, you know, advantages to the carriers. And so therefore they're more likely to be based on than just this stochastic process that I was talking about. And then migration, which most people think of as like people moving from place A to place B, which we also think about in those terms, but for geneticists also might mean just gene flow. So the arrival of particular variants from that were in population A that now migrate through say reproduction, for example, to population B, right? And it's the interplay of these and how likely these things are in each generation, uh, you know, in, in particular um, settings that, you know, we try to study and then try to reconstruct to then infer evolutionary history. But I mentioned that mutation and recombination are extremely important, especially for the first part of this talk today. And so mutation is nothing more, as I said, as, you know, as the, accumulation of copies of, of errors of copy uh, of the DNA chain through time. And so you can think about that the, when two populations are diverging, they're more likely to have a higher number of variants separating them, the longer they've separated for, or the, the more generations that are, right? Because, you know, bacteria, for example, reproduce way faster than humans, so you don't need as much time but so time here is a unit that is, you know, relative to the generation time. So how fast are, you know, individuals reproducing in a population? So then this can be, you know, abstractly think of as like a type of clock. You know, if you know the rate at which things change, you know when things split. And so the expectation is the more different two, you know, DNA copies are from one another, the longer ago they've diverged. So this is important to keep in mind. And the second one is how this then is shuffled in each generation in the case of sexually reproducing organisms like humans. And so if I'm showing you here, so if you have this blue chromosome, each of us is like, is diploid. So we have two copies of each chromosome. Each gene is, you know, copied twice in our genomic repertoire. And so we inherit one from our mom and one from our dad. And so if you imagine that, you know, we got the blue chromosome from mom and the red chromosome from dad, and the differences between them are shown as this capital letters A, B, C on the blue version and small a, small b, and small c on the red version. What we're actually transmitting to our kids is not one or the other. It's actually a mosaic of both these chromosomes, right? And there's a probability that these mosaic is constructed based on what we call recombination. So the exchange of genetic material between homologous chromosomes that then we transmit to the next generation. And so you can imagine, for example, here, 
it was the C that was that under underwent crossover. So we have either the possibility of transmitting this blue chromosome with this small stretch of red or vice versa with 50% probability. Now, these, you know, is just one possible combination. It could have been that, you know, the A's underwent crossover, that the B's underwent crossover and so on and so forth. So now if you imagine this process taking over like thousands of generations and like here I'm like trying to simplify, you know, if we start from the present, this is all the individuals that we have in a population and we try to reconstruct their history back in time, what we end up is, uh, you know, finding a pattern or a mosaic of ancestry blocks, each of, you know, each of which tell a different part of the evolutionary history of these individuals. So you can say, for example, we can track this blue block in this individual here on the left, and we can go back and see that, you know, this was inherited from this ancestor, who inherited from this ancestor, who inherited from this ancestor, and so on until this one. So that piece of DNA is telling a different story from, say, you know, the yellow one, which was inherited from this ancestor, right? So we can actually look in the genome and find blocks of information that tell us different parts of our history. And it's another thing that we should keep in mind. So imagine that, you know, our, the genetic information that is contained within an individual genome is nothing more than a collection of histories of different ancestors. And what I'm going to talk about today is how some of those ancestors, you know, are typically classified as, you know, archaic species or other, you know, human groups. Um, but so the idea is the way we are fetching these sequences, you know, follows the principle that we can detect these portions of ancestry blocks that were inherited from different populations. And so if we're looking at the recombinant block or an ancestry block inherited from Neanderthals, what we're actually, what that piece of DNA is telling us is the history of the ancestors of our, or our, of like, or of our own ancestors, but that history was lived through the Neanderthals, right? Cool. So, and why have I told you all, like, all of this to get to, you know, what I want to present? Because I think, you know, uh, the kind of question we were interested in this first project looking at the deep past, so the encounters between so-called modern humans and archaic uh, species. And I say so-called because I do challenge the notion that these are potentially different species, uh, but we can discuss this. I'm just opening uh, that for you now. Um, but, you know, but what, why this is important is because we're trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out, like, we're trying to understand a process for which we don't have complete genetic information. So island Southeast Asia, as I say here, is a unique place for many different reasons. So the first reason is its biogeography. Uh, and I don't need to tell all of the people in this room and probably online who know more about island Southeast Asia than I do. Um, but so, you know, back when in the late Pleistocene, when humans or so-called anatomically modern humans migrated or first are thought to have migrated through this region, the Western Indonesian islands were connected by land to mainland uh, Southeast Asia, in particular Borneo, uh, you know, Java, and Sumatra. And so it, there was an actual corridor um, on which, through which people could migrate, um, you know, and this, this corridor was part of this continental shelf known as the Sunda land. However, this uh, continental shelf was always separated for like not always but for the part of history that we're interested in the last million like the last several millions of years um from the islands immediately to its uh, east uh, and they were separated by uh this geographical barrier known as wallace's line which is one of the strongest biogeographical barriers for the dispersal of terrestrial mammals and like vertebrates um, and it's effectively separated, uh, you know, marsupial from placental mammals, right, and has given rise to this different evolution of these two groups. And so Wallace's line is a really important biogeographic barrier for the dispersal of, of fauna, but we know that at least from 700,000 years ago, there's human-like presence 
in the islands immediately to the east of Wallace's line. So we know that people migrated from the Sunda land into the islands, in some islands of, you know, island Southeast Asia, including the Philippines. And we know because there's stone tool records dating back to 700,000 years ago. And there was recently a discover a discovery of a new supposedly type of uh, species or a new human species known as Homo luzonensis in the island of Luzon in northern Philippines. We also know there's stone tools in uh, Sulawesi, approximately, I think, 200,000 years ago. And you, you would correct me if I'm wrong, because people here have been working extensively on this. Uh, but also in Flores, uh, with Homo luzonen, or with Homo floresiensis, excuse me, being described in 2004, almost 20 years ago. So we know that humans moved and were able to cross the geographical barrier that is Wallace's line. We have no evidence yet of human-like presence in Sahul, so the continental, you know, shelf that is like separated from the Sunda by this island, Southeast Asia um, group of islands here, uh, before 65,000, since Majabibi is the earliest, uh, you know, sort of reliable date for the arrival of human-like groups in, in this area of the, of the world. But why is this interesting beyond the biogeography and also the human presence? Is that we have evidence, genetic evidence, for the largest proportion of Denisovan ancestry of anywhere in the world in populations living precisely east of Wallace's line. Uh, and the, the problem here is that Denisovans were firstly described and solely described based on a small fragment of a pinky finger found in this cave that I'm showing here in Siberia, known as Denisova Cave, and it's the name Denisovans. And this species, you know, like this is all the direct, you know, the only direct evidence, well, at least at that stage, now there's like a potential mandibule in Tibet and so on, but we can discuss that later. But genetic evidence for Denisovans only comes Direct evidence comes from this fossil here. Right? And so this is in Siberia, but somehow these group of humans contributed mostly, you know, more than even to populations in East Asia, they've contributed to populations in island Southeast Asia and in Sahul. And so we have a question here that, you know, the patterns of the needs of an ancestry and the presence of human-like groups in this region for 700,000 years ago, seemingly pose an interesting problem, which is, first of all, is it possible that the fossils that we know, and including some Homo erectus fossils, which we know survived in the area approximately until, you know, 100,000 years ago in Java, but also the fossils of Homo, Homo luzonensis and Homo floresiensis, are they potentially responsible for the sickness? And if not, right, because the Nisovans are supposed to have split from modern humans you know, between 500 and 700,000 years ago, whereas these other groups that we do find evidence for in island Southeast Asia are thought to be a much older split based on morphological comparisons, but also on datings, right? They are too early in the scene if we assume a continuous presence of these groups. They are too early to be the new ones. But the fact is that we don't know their DNA, so we have no DNA evidence for these groups. And for the new ones, we do have the DNA, but we do not have a lot of fossil evidence. So our question was, is it possible, let's assume that, you know, current taxonomical classifications of these groups in island Southeast Asia are actually right, and that these groups are deep, are deep splitting lineages. So they split from our own lineage, maybe two million years ago, maybe more. Since we don't have their DNA, is it possible to sort of go around and try to circumvent this problem by looking in modern human genomes for signatures that would be compatible with admixture events with deeply divergent lineages. Right? And that's what we did. But how do you go about it if you don't have the DNA? So, sorry, this is where our sort of crash course comes in hand. So imagine that you have a human chromosome that is like just blue, which happens to be my favorite color. Um, and then, you know, that, those parts of blue are interspersed with ancestry blocks here shown in red, which happens to be my least favorite color. <laughs> but those, those interspread blocks are actually inherited from the Nisovans and Neanderthals, right? So these result from known admixture events 
uh, between so-called like Neanderthals and Denisovans in Eurasia somewhere. Right? And this process, like the way these blocks are interspersed just follows from recombination events. And the way we can distinguish between blue and red is because of the mutations that have accumulated through time since the split of those two groups, right? Humans in Africa, Neanderthals and Denisovans in Europe and Asia. What if there was another source of genetic material for which we don't have uh, you know, DNA from? And let's call them super archaic, just because they are thought of been like long split uh, between, you know, uh, like two, two modern humans. So if we rely on this con on conventional methods to detect, you know, what we call introgression, which is nothing more than detecting episodes of admixture events between Neanderthals, say, and humans, these conventional methods, typically what they do is that they use the genetic information from Neanderthals and Denisovans, which we know, right? compare it to like modern humans and basically ask, do I see bits of Neanderthal and Denisovan in the modern human genome, right? And because we, we have that information, we can do that directly. So we can fish out the sequences. But if we don't have, you know, like information for potentially other sources, here shown in orange, a color to which I'm neutral, uh, then like we need to be a bit more creative. And there was this new, Statistical implementation that came out in 2018 by Lawrence Scott, uh, who's you know who was first in Copenhagen when he developed this uh, in order, sorry, and now he moved to Leipzig. Um, but what he did is that he proposed a method that actually is agnostic to the introgressing source. So whoever can, whatever looks weird and old in the genome, this method is fishing. And the way it's doing this is that so if you if you imagine, so let's say that this um branch here is our arcade and these two branches here represent two modern human populations right an out group and an in group and let's assume that the in group receives an input from the arcade at a particular rate because because of the split times mutations will have accumulated and they are shown here as these circles yellow or orange in the case of the human lineage and blue in the case of the arcade when these sequences then, you know, when, when admixture occurs, these sequences are inherited and they, they become part of the gene pool of the in-group, which received this contribution, but not from the out-group. So if we look at the chromosome, what we end up is that we observe a bunch of variants, some of which are, sh are, are shared with the out-group, but some of which are not. And what this method looks at is that if we remove the variants that are shared with the outgroup, can we get a nexus, like regions of the genome that show a nexus of variation? So it's like mutation rate, imagine, would be higher, or that you would need more time to explain why the differences between group A and group B. Right? So that's what it does, it's agnostic. And so we apply this to more than 400 human genomes globally, uh, including like 100, more than 160 from island Southeast Asia novel genomes, which had been published precisely looking at the needs of an integration in this region, which had been published by our collaborators, Guy Jacobs, Murray Cox, and Harris Sugoi, which are very fortunate to work with. And so what we did is that we basically took what they did in their paper. So we took these two implementations using conventional methods that detect the needs of an ancestry in this case, and we apply this new method. And then what we've done is that, okay, so if we detect all of these, right, potentially, we then, so imagine the red was detected by this, you know, conventional methods to detect Neanderthal and Nisevan, but then we also detected other regions that were not reported by them, by them in the previous paper. So what we've done is that we excluded those regions and we were left with a bunch of unknown, potentially introgressed regions of the genome in populations worldwide. And we call this residual archaic sequences. And of course, you, you might understand why we are so hesitant to call them like truly super archaic or whatever interbreast, because we do not have direct DNA evidence for any of these groups. Therefore, we need to be cautious uh, because these are all statistical and computational methods, right? So then the first thing we did is that we looked at how much, you know, of both known 
archaic sequences and unknown archaic sequences are we detecting globally? And here I'm showing in the in the x-axis populations, you know, from the west as much as possible, from the west to the east, so from Europe to Australia, and how much known and unknown ancestry were we able to detect? So, and as you can see, so in purple is the amount of Neanderthal and Denisovan combined ancestry, and you see that once you go from well, uh, you know, west ISEA, so west of Wallace's line into the eastern parts of Wallace's line, so in Eastern uh, Indonesia, you do see this jump in known archaic introgression. And that's due to the aforementioned Denise of an ancestry that we already knew. But what we were interested in is in these green bits. And strikingly, you don't seem to see, you know, any big differences, at least to the level that are very clear, you know, on the purple known introgress regions. You do, you could argue for a slightly higher proportion, again, east of Wallace's line, but that becomes hard, at least on this plot. So what we've done next is that, okay, so we do not see evidence for like a difference in, you know, how much unknown regions you have, but is the nature of this. So if we look at the composition of the sequences in these residual blocks, are they compatible with a model that, for example, would suggest that Homo floresiensis, you know, admixed with human populations outside of Africa. And so if you can imagine again, is that, you know, the time of the split between, say, Homo floresiensis, could be Homo erectus, could be Homo luzonensis, doesn't matter, of a deeply divergent lineage, is much larger than that between, uh, you know, Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans, and also between modern human populations. So if this did occur, it is possible that these blocks contain genetic variants that, while we don't know the state in this population because we do not have their DNA, we could see that whatever test population we're you know, looking at would actually be different from all the others. So the known ones, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and say African populations, which in this model are assumed to not have had any contributions. So that's so you would expect an excess of these patterns of one zero zero zeros and zero one one ones, essentially. And so this is what I'm showing you here. So on the left, the zero one one ones, and you can see that we have an average proportion of about between five to 6% with a lower proportion, seemingly lower proportion in Papua and Australia. But I mean, again, this is almost a qualitative argument. The opposite trend in one zero 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 is but a much higher proportion between 26 and 28%. So we do seem to you know, observe this pattern that the more residual sequence you have, also the more one zero zero zeros you have. But then the first thing we did is, okay, what if this just results from Neanderthal and Denisovan admixture that the conventional methods are not detect detecting, but somehow our method happens to be better at this. And so we try to correlate the proportion of these two types of motifs within the sequences, and we observe that they actually correlate negatively in the case of the 0111s and positively in the case of the 1000s. So we believe actually that these might represent novel mutations in the test population. So it's nothing happening there. It's just that that population underwent a mutation that makes it different from all the other tested groups. Whereas this one might actually represent, you know, Denisovan and Neanderthal ancestry that the other methods are not detecting. And when we compare this to coalescent simulation, so we do this, you know, we simulated different models of human demography. And the only change that we make is how much potential contribution that existed from a super archaic source in island Southeast Asia. And what we observe is that the, the patterns within these residual sequences, so the 0111s and the 1000s, the proportion of them are strikingly similar to real observations in the case where we can see that either no admixture or at maximum 0.1%. So very, very low amount of admixture from like potentially super archaic sources. So with all of these evidence, we propose that there's no, you know, super archaic introgression in Island Southeast Asia. Now, but that raises a question, no? Uh, it raises the question that we have all these, you know, the needs of an ancestry in this region. We seemingly do not have any super archaic ancestry compatible with Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis, or Homo luzonensis. But that's only if you assume that they are really divergent. What if you assume that they are not? That divergent. And I know that for paleoanthropologists, it's almost like an erratic statement, but I'm a geneticist, so I can make them. Uh, 
So what if you assume that they're actually much closer to, to humans? And then if you put on top of that, the fact that we don't actually know what the Denisovan is supposed to look like. I mean, we assume we know, but I don't think we can. I mean, no one has persuaded me with an argument that they can actually tell me what a Denisovan is supposed to look like. I think people mostly assume that they are supposed to look like Neanderthals, but we don't know. That raises the question. I mean, at least these fossils are at the right time and the right place to be the sources of this ancestry. And of course, my most of my co-authors uh, <laughs> thought I was a bit crazy. Um, and so we propose an alternative scenario. So if they are not you know, responsible for this, then we might yet have to find you know, the knees of fossils in island Southeast Asia, which is a, equally exciting, if you ask me. Because to me, the genetic patterns are compatible with these events occurring in situ and not having been the result of you know, later migrations and so on. Now, if we if you assume that we need to still find them somewhere in island Southeast Asia, this Denisovan groups. So one of the things that, and this is Chris Helgen at the Australian Museum who is responsible for this, you know, insights, is that you can contrast the patterns of megafauna survival in different islands uh, east of Wallace's line to the presence of human fossils. And so we know that megafauna survives in the Philippines, it survives in Flores. And it also survives in Sulawesi. And so the idea is if there were, you know, super archaic or human-like presence, or sorry, archaic or human-like presence in Eastern Indonesia prior to modern human arrival, these groups of megafauna might have become habituated to hunting precious. And therefore, when the, you know, the more efficient human hunters arri arrived in the scene, they were able to survive better. Of course, this is, you know, conjecture but it's also based on you know evidence of you know not only megafauna survival but also the existence of stone tools in Sulawesi so maybe Sulawesi could be a place to look for the needs of this all right <laughs> so that's that's all for the deep bust uh, I don't know if you want to ask questions or if we leave this to later on I hope you're not all sleeping by now up, um, up to you if you want to take I wouldn't blame you um yeah like uh, I, I can keep going or I can like whatever you, maybe we do it at the end okay so it has okay so that's one now i want you to rewire <laughs> from like late places in island southeast asia to you know uh medieval europe <laughs> um which is a very similar place um so it's actually a project uh um that i you know was lucky to you know uh sort of coordinate last year and uh, you know uh, it's one of these things that uh, in science, they occur when you're not expecting, you find a result that end up, ends up being a really interesting finding and a, a really lucky finding too. Um, and so this is a case you know, uh, of an individual uh, specific, just one individual that we um, you know, collected genetic information from. And this individual was living in this place called Castro de Valenche, which is in northeastern Portugal, where I'm from. That's why I can say this so well. Uh, <laughs> and this, you know, it's a place called Braganza. So it's just a really, if you've ever been, uh, or if you ever, will ever think about visiting Portugal, I really encourage you to visit Braganza. It's a really interesting uh, place up in the mountains, inland, just very close to Spain. So you might not there cross the border. Uh, but anyway, so this established so the Castro de Valenza was, you know, the the uh, was prior to the establishment of the city of Braganza, which is a capital of district these days, and it was established in the Iron Age. Um, and this we know from Roman, you know, uh, ethnography and history that you know uh, there were th this place was inhabited by a tribe, an, an Iron Age tribe called the Zuele. Um, that it was also very important in Roman in the Roman period because it was connecting two Roman capitals of province. Um, so Asturica Augusta and Bracara Augusta. So in, in, in one now in current Spain and the other one in current Portugal. So this was sort of a crossroads between uh, these two capitals. It was also later, uh, you know, post-Roman period, it was a capital of like uh, the bishop um, from, you know, like a Suebi, the Suebi of inhabitants. So, you know, we had Visigoths and Suebi you know, sort of replacing Roman uh, rule in uh, in Iberia, and so this was part of the Suebi uh, sort of uh, 
sphere of influence, if we, if we call it like this. Anyway, and this is a monastery of the, of the really tiny village these days, uh, which was built in uh, 12th century, but of course it has been renovated, otherwise it wouldn't look that good. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, so I've, you know, this is part of collaborations I have uh, ongoing with colleagues in Portugal, trying to understand, you know, as Beth was saying in the beginning, more of these historical migrations of people, right? And how genetics can actually sort of be contrasted to, you know, historical, linguistic, and so on, uh, like different types of data. And so this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, the site the, where this individual is excavated from, I think it's from here. That's where they found the necropolis. This is, used to be the old uh, Castro. I don't know if you have an English word for this. These were like, uh, do you say Castro as well? These were like Iron Age settlements. And there's like a type of buildings which were like round in shape and so on, as opposed to the Roman more rectangular shaped buildings. And this was, of course, uh, placed in uh, very conveniently in high ground. And this is the current uh, city of uh, Bragança at the, at the background, in the background. So this is photos from my colleagues in the excavations, which I'm very fortunate. And I, you know, I worked in particular with Sophia, uh, PhD student in this project. And, uh, you know, she was, you know, the one interested in understanding the history of this population. <laughs> and so this individual that I'm going to talk about is, you know, uh, an individual that was uh, unearthed from a necropolis in, in this, in this uh, small village and who, who has been radiocarbon dated. Uh, to more or less a thousand years ago. So it's from, you know, the 11th to the 12th century. And so what my colleagues were interested in is like, you know, uh, trying to understand using genetics, like, you know, what's the, not only the genetic sort of ancestry of the population, but also the dynamics that might have occurred in comparison to other places in Portugal that we're also studying. Uh, and so we have other samples from this site as well. Uh, and one of the questions most of my colleagues, and Sophie is an anthropologist, that they are, interested in is sort of whether we can, you know, infer the genetic sex of a particular individuals. Sure, sure, of course, like we can do that. We can look at, you know, uh, genetics to inform what's the biological sex of a person. And so we did this uh, from the, for, for this individual and the idea, you know, what we used for this specific project and also because we're interested in, you know, inferring demography and trying to be as unbiased as possible within the complications of ancient DNA, what we did is what's called the shotgun sequencing approach, where you essentially take all the ancient DNA molecules from, you know, in this case was bone. And then what you do is that you sequence all these ancient molecules and then you map it to the human genome. The idea is, unfortunately, because ancient DNA is degraded, it comes in really small. Uh, chunks, so it, it, you know, DNA is degraded, so it's fragmented, and it undergoes also chemical transformations that allows us, you know, to actually identify those molecules as truly ancient or not. And so the the way this works is that you have ancient DNA fragments from your pool, so you do a sequencing pool, and then you try and map this to the chromosomes, right? So again, the blue chromosome is shown here. And so after you take fetch all of these fragments and map it back, you have, you know, what's called like sort of mapped reads. So you have sequencing reads, so DNA information that is mapped back into their corresponding pieces of the puzzle. So you can already imagine that the number of sequencing reads that we have for a particular individual and that map to a particular chromosome, they reflect not only the chromosome size, so the longer chromosomes like one, two, three, they will have more sequences than the smaller chromosomes like 20, 21, 22 but also the dosage. So as I said, we have, we inherit two chromosomes. So we have two copies for each uh, chromosome, one inherited from mom, one inherited from dad. And the way we do then the genetic, you know, the inference of the biological sex of these individuals is that we contrast how many reads are mapping to the X chromosome and whether there are any reads mapping to the Y chromosome. And so that it tells us whether, you know, the individual is biological female if it ha if the, that individual has two X chromosomes or biological male if that individual has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. So what, and then the plots look like this. <laughs> they look like a uh, mess. <laughs> and so, but in this mess, we try, so usually what we can say is that from this mass, mess, 
uh, sorry, I'll just go again. So we could identify, we can identify how many of these sequencing reads are mapping to the Y chromosome and the proportion of these sequencing reads and how many are mapping to the X chromosome. And so if we observe like double the amount mapping to the X chromosome, as you, we see for the, uh, for this group, for example, which maps equally to the X and the Y, we can infer then which ones are genetic males, genetic females, and these bunch of individuals which are undetermined. And that has to do with either the fact that we don't have enough ancient DNA from these individuals, there's errors in sequence, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're trying to infer this. But then we found this dot. <laughs> and the reason why we thought this dot was important from this plot is because we were also already thinking about using this type of approaches to look for chromosomal aneuploidies. And chromosomal aneuploidies are cases where you have, where a particular individual has a higher number of chromosomes than, you know, typical, typically observed, right? So humans have 22 pairs of chromosomes and then either two X chromosomes, totaling 46, or one X and one I. There are cases, for example, in, you know, uh, Down syndrome, where individuals carry an extra copy of the of chromosome 21, right? So we, we were already thinking whether we could use this type of information to infer like sort of aneuploidies to be found. And that's why we focused on this individual, which looked interesting. And so basically we then took that, you know, simple assumption of, you know, reads mapping to particular chromosomes reflect the size and the dosage to then derivate like a statistical method which is a Bayesian method, which is like, okay, so if this is my observation and I am expecting this, right? So what's the probability that this individual has this particular karyotype? So this particular number of chromosomes. And so this is this all looks like this mess. You have to trust me that, uh, and I trust Ben too, because uh, this is what developed by Ben Rohrlach um, in Leipzig. And so this is simply that. It's like, if you have a vector of DNA sequencing reads, the probability of them mapping to different chromosomes reflects you know, the copy and the size, but also the errors and the contamination rates and so on, right? So this model takes all of that into account and looks ugly, but then we were able to clean. So if we remove all of these guys in the middle, sorry, all, uh, all of these guys in the middle, plus the reads which we're not really sure were ancient or not, if we clean the data, what these plots end up look like is something like this, which is much prettier. And then using that analytical method and simulations, we can then say, all right, if I'm simulating an individual with karyotype, you know, uh, XX, XY, or XXY, which would be compatible with this observation here, as the number of copies potentially in the X chromosome is the same as seen in females, but is there's a, a similar number of reads in the Y chromosome as that seen in the genetic males, we then simulate this and ask, so what's the probability that if this is a true XXY individual, like where do I expect that my reads will fall, fall within this plot? And so what I'm showing you here, this is empirical data. So each dot is empirical data. Each ellipsis is uh, simulated data. Is where you would expect the males to fall, the genetic males, XYs based on the different set of parameters like like contamination amount of reads and so on so the the more uncertainty you have so the the bigger this cloud gets and so you see that all these individuals fall within the xy group and then all these individuals here fall within the expectations for xx so genetic females and then if we look at that particular individual it falls within the expected you know variation if you have an XXY individual. So we have now a diagnose of a thousand year old case of an individual that is a 46, 47 uh, XXY karyotype, which is known as Kleinfelter syndrome. And what we did, which is interesting, is that if we assume that this just comes from a combination of, you know, you know either the experiment uh, or you know, the sample is contaminated by both, you know, an XX and an XY individual, where do we expect this to follow, to fall within this plot? And we know that you, we, we just observe that it just follows along this axis, as you would expect. So the more male or female contamination you have, it's going to move along this axis, but not along this axis. Right. And then 
the only thing we had for this individual was, you know, not the only thing. We had a complete skeleton, so we were really fortunate. So we could go back and then actually look into, you know, in this individual's skeletal phenotypes, you know, for evidence potentially associated with this type of syndrome. So we knew that this individual was the tallest in the collection and that individuals that, you know, carry an extra copy of the X chromosome along with the Y, XXY individuals tend to be taller. Um, and that, you know, Kleinfelter syndrome, so the, the existence of an extra X chromosome in, you know, genetic males leads to, you know, uh, different, you know, uh, hormonal composition, in particular, you know, androgen deficiency, but also high levels of FSH, which then leads to the development of all sorts of traits, which are, you know, sec typically secondary traits associated with females, right? And so, and these include like reduced muscle strength, obesity, low glucose, diabetes, and so on. And the only, but we couldn't test any of this, right? Obviously, by looking at the skeleton. One thing we could do is we could test for osteoporosis, right? Because we had the bones. We could, we could at least infer whether at the time of death, this individual had or not, you know, signals of osteoporosis. I must also say that, you know, Kleinfelter syndrome, you know, remains highly underdiagnosed because, you know, uh, most people just, you know, don't know, like they just live their lives. And so it's actually when, you know, some, you know, cases of infertility emerge that people seek, you know, uh, treatment for that. And then they are diagnosed with Kleinfelter. And so we look for osteoporosis, I was saying, but we unfortunately saw, or for that, not unfortunately, we just happened not to see any evidence for that. So we can't say, we can say that at least at the time of death, uh, there was no evidence for osteoporosis in this individual. So, yeah, and then we've done a more comprehensive genetic analysis and tried to see, you know, what's the genetic ancestry of this individual below, beyond, you know, just this uh, karyotype analysis. And here I'm, uh, this is really bad, so I'm, I apologize. In my computer, it looks really good. And I think in Zoom, it looks clear too, <laughs> not in the room. Uh, but yeah, so this individual is here shown as like, you know, this black diamond and it falls within the distribution of contemporary you know, Western European and Southern European populations. And on the right, I'm showing you like the available data for ancient black populations from Iberia, you know, including Gibraltar, Portugal, and, and Spain. And it's also, you know, typically, you know, it's, it, you know, it was an Iberian individual as far as we can tell. Um, and so that concludes uh, my journey through like, you know, Pleistocene human evolution, medieval Europe, and like, you know, human uh, demography, but also, you know, the incidence of, you know, different genetic syndromes of time and how we actually, or, you know, are trying to combine differences of evidence. And, I, you know, like here, I focus on the genetic part of this project on this blind filter, but, you know, the fact that we had a dating, an archaeological, really well-established, you know, context that we then went and did the anthropological analysis. I mean, this is to me what makes this, you know, that made this paper like so interesting. And we actually presented it as a clinical case, right? So this is, you know, uh, you know, maybe I think the ancient, the oldest, you know, uh, genetic clinical case or a clinical case that at least includes genetic information. So I have many people to thank uh, for this, including the institutions that, uh, you know, uh, are mad enough to pay my uh, salary, including the ANU. Um, but yeah, no. So I I do appreciate uh, all the support, including for the from the ARC, but mostly. For all the people that have worked with me and keep working with me, um, the students, and I haven't mentioned like Xavi Rocarada, PhD student with me in Adelaide, who did all the genetic analysis for this uh, client felt and paper, um, but also all the co-authors, you know, including Ray, who has, you know, I've been working with for many, many years, and uh, it's good fun, and like we keep uh, going and doing these projects, but yeah, so, and thank you for listening. Okay.